let's say China. China, 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 China. So this week, President Xi Jinping is off on his holly bobs to Moscow to meet with dear old Vlad. And I know that like a lot of you, I was on the edge of my seat a few weeks back, carefully following President Xi Jinping's hard fought campaign to be confirmed as president for a record third term. I too sweated as the vote was cast during the National People's Congress and waited to see what the result would be. In the end, President Xi squeaked home, winning just 2,952 votes to none against, with no opposition. So phew, it's great to see democracy like this in action, and I'm sure everybody in the People's Republic will be glad that the frantic election season is finally over. It's worth considering, of course, that at his last election, he won 2,970 votes, so I'd say he was losing grip on power, but it would seem that a number of delegates were unable to attend locations unknown. Of course, that can't possibly be sinister in the workers' paradise. Perhaps they're simply busy discussing corruption charges with the state security services or enjoying some time under residential surveillance at a designated location. Who knows? Who cares? The important thing is that Xi Jinping has become the first Premier of China to have a third term since Mao, and all is stable and in order. And of course, we all remember how well things went under Mao. First up on President Xi's agenda, a trip to Russia to meet Vladimir and chat quietly about exactly what the fuck he thinks he's doing in Ukraine. As we'll see, President Xi is not a man who exactly embraces change. He likes predictable, he likes stable, he likes nice linear outcomes, not some mess of a conflict that has re-energized NATO, the US military and world democracy in general. And it could have all been going so well. The EU was breaking up. The Donald was busy making sure that the 2024 elections would be the last free and fair elections in United States history. And capitalism was, at least according to the Internet, failing everywhere. Not to mention the fact that everybody was looking too weak to protect Taiwan. And now Vlad has dropped this cowpat into the Chinese paddy field of foreign affairs. Still, never let a good crisis go to waste and all that. And China has a few unsettled scores with Russia. So off Z goes. And as the 100th anniversary of the revolution draws closer, this is an important moment. Like a 19th century debutante, China is emerging onto the world stage, wildly wealthy, with a big, strong military and a set of somewhat confused desires. She has her makeup on, her best frock, she's packing a few hundred nukes for safety's sake, and she doesn't want to catch the eye of an attractive partner so much as stomp the global south into conformity through a combination of economic force and military firepower, whilst remembering the advice her father gave her about the nasty West and its disease of democracy. China has global interests in a way that it has never had before. There are loans to dozens of states, Brazil, Venezuela, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, to mention just a few, and those loans are now coming due. A combination of the war in Ukraine, global food prices rising, the lack of American interest under Trump, all of this means China has a reach now far beyond its borders into politics globally. The war in Ukraine has massively weakened Moscow's control over Central Asian states like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, and they're now lining up to support Beijing providing high quality oil, rare earth minerals and strategic bases, some of which are on, China, on Russia's borders. Xi has ordered his military to be ready to take Taiwan by 2027, but it hasn't been in a shooting war since the mid-1960s. Their kit is untested, as is their military control. And the border disputes with India, Japan, the US, Korea and Russia all remain unresolved. China struggles to be taken seriously on the world stage. And the question that is on everybody's lips is, what exactly does China want? And I'm going to try and answer this question if it kills me. And we're going to do this in a few parts. Firstly, we're going to look at ancient Chinese history to the point where the communists took over. Then we're going to talk about the communist period in a bit more detail and consider what it tells us about China today. And then we'll look at whether or not China is actually a free market in disguise. Finally, then, we're going to talk about China today and what it might do next, using the first parts as a guide. Come with me, if you will, then, into the China zone. Chapter 1, a culturally sensitive and nuanced discussion of the whole of Chinese history in about 10 minutes. Like all discussions on China, this is fraught with difficulties. Not least, I'm not Chinese, as you may have guessed from my accent. I'm a bloke on the internet, and you should treat everything I say with a degree of caution. I don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese, so my pronunciations will be awful, and I apologize. China is unspeakably complex, so I'm going to have to do a Donald and grossly oversimplify some history here to fit a narrative story. However, in my defense, I'm going to do that to add to people's understanding and not to try and become president by stroking people's fears and hatreds for my own political ends. Well, mostly.
If you ask a Chinese person, especially if that person is Han Chinese, they will tell you that China has been one country for over 5,000 years. And it was, according to mythology, founded by Shu of the Xi dynasty. But in reality, the first recognizable dynasty for which we have any actual evidence is the Zhou dynasty in about 1000 BCE. Whichever way you look at this, China is freaking old. I'm not going to get too deep into the various early dynasties. We're going to skip to the end in a second and just look at the last one. But before I do that, I might want to just highlight a couple of concepts which come from early Chinese history, which very much inform the way that China behaves today. The first is the Qin Ming, or the Mandate of Heaven. This essentially says that China is the font of all civilization. It also says that rulers better not behave in a tyrannical fashion, because if they do, they'll be overthrown. Now, this was a bit tricky for the early rulers, because it could look like it was all going swimmingly well until suddenly it wasn't anymore, and they were killed. Effectively, the favour of heaven is determined posthumously. China, number one, has been a chant for a couple of millennia, and it's stuck. Perhaps surprisingly, given how central this concept was for the emperors, under Xi's rule, the Chinese Communist Party has taken this ball and run with it. Where Deng Xiaoping, father of the modern China, talked about biding your time and hiding your strength, Xi is very much more of a China fuckier kind of a guy, which has implications for all of us. And he's very much latched on to the mandate of heaven as a conceptual framework for the Chinese military to use when it's developing and showing off their capabilities. When we talk about China today a bit later on, we can discuss exactly what that means. But we should have it in our minds now that China believes that it is the, the single font of all civilization, even to this day. The second concept which emerged from the dynastic period is Confucianism. Uh, much misunderstood by hippies of the 1960s, the framework for Confucianism emerged a bit later and has been much added to and altered. It's somewhere between a philosophical framework and a traditional religion. It still underpins significant parts of Chinese culture today. Now, I'm going to go ahead and sum up 2000 years of detailed and nuanced thinking by some of the brightest minds of humanity by saying Confucianism is a good answer to the question, how do you create and maintain order in somewhere as vast as China? Confucianism says that society's collective needs outweigh the needs of any single member of that society. Everybody has their place and should stick to it, essentially. I might get shouted at for telling peasants to know their place, but some dude with a large moustache says it in pithy ways and they get venerated as a near saint. I mean, like, it's not fucking fair, but whatever. If you think of Confucianism as classic European medieval feudal system, but without the boring stuff about Jesus and instead some more practical bits and pieces and a degree of ancestor worship on the side, you're not too far off. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how Confucianism does it. If that's a thing you're interested in, there are lots of resources that you can get out through Google. Were you able to get an official from the Chinese Communist Party today in a room and ask them, doubtless they would say that Confucianism is an outmoded way of thinking and a relic from the past which was stamped out during the Cultural Revolution, yada, 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 yada. But the reality is right there and deeply rooted. It's still useful to the CCP today. With Xi Jinping as leader, a man who is obsessed with stability above all else, Confucian thinking is having something of a renaissance. As we'll see in future episodes, Xi has instituted mass testing on his ideas, sayings and thoughts throughout Chinese civil service. And many of those are deeply rooted in Confucian concepts of duty. The final dynasty, which ruled from the mid-1600s to 1912, was the Qing dynasty. If we're going to be all dull and fact-based, then the Qing dynasty expanded China's borders further than anyone before or since. If we want to partake of mushrooms and head off into fantasy land, then the Qing were merely reclaiming the mythical borders of China from 5,000 years ago. Pick your speed and go with it. Either way, Emperor, sorry, sorry, my mistake, uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping has claimed that the borders of China at the height of the Qing dynasty were the natural borders of modern China. It's a bit of a bummer if you happen to live in bits of India, Russia, Thailand, most of North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Tibet, Andhra Manchuria, Mongolia, and various other places, but Xi's view is really not that different from mainstream Han Chinese thinking today. Of course, there were quite a few other ethnic groups within those borders, and indeed still are today, Mongolians, Tibetans, Rija, Mao, Dong, Bai, and many others, all of whom may have things to say about those natural borders where they're given a chance. Uh, this is a bit of an aside, but those five stars on the Chinese flag, they represent the so-called five nations, Han, Manchu, Mongols, Hui, and Tibetans. You might note that the two lists I gave aren't the same, and you probably read about the millions of Ouija currently enjoying their holidays in re-education camps. Again, we're going to talk about those in a later episode, but it's pretty fucked up. Back to the Qing. 
The last years of the Qing dynasty were a bit of a shit show. In the late 1600s and early 1700s, the British East India Company pulled up and demanded that the Chinese sell them tea. This was an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, as China was pretty much a closed shop for the West. They considered the rest of the world to be populated by barbarians with nothing of any interest to the heavenly kingdom. The East India Company, by contrast, viewed the world as being populated by barbarians who it could profit from and had the warships to back up that claim. The British East India Company said, I know you little yellow fellows, give us some of your tea for these shiny beads. And the empire was like, we have lots of beads, screw you, Vichu. If you want tea, bring some silver or fuck me back off where you came from. And so there was a cantankerous and mistrustful 150 odd years of trading and screwing around with one another. By the early 1830s, the British were running an operation that would have made, made the mid 1970s CIA weep for joy. They got farmers in northern India to grow industrial quantities of opium. They then smuggled that opium into China and sold it for silver. They then used that silver to buy tea off the authorities. The joy of this scheme was the more opium they pushed, the more silver they had, the less silver China had, the lower the price of the tea, the more profits for the East India Company. The Chinese were understandably less than thrilled about having a fucking drug cartel undermining their state and fighting inevitably broke out. One thing led to another, the Royal Navy happened, and by 1860, Britain had claimed Hong Kong, Kowloon and the New Territories. Worse for the Qing, a number of other nations had made claims to Chinese territory whilst they were distracted fighting the British, not least the Russians, who demanded and then being given the whole of Anto Manchuria. As you can imagine, China fucking loved this period of time and the memories still run deep. It's worth bearing this in mind while she is in Moscow. Whilst they hate Britain for being democratic and stealing their land, we at least gave it back. Russia still hasn't. The death knell for the Qing came in the 1890s when resentments over foreign encroachment and in particular the promotion of Christianity by Westerners exploded into violence across eastern China. What became known as the Boxer Rebelling saw people Peking occupied by Western forces and imperial authority fully and finally removed. There then followed several decades of confusion during which the Chinese Communist Party was founded and it began its long fight of supremacy against its main rival in the on-again, off-again civil wars. The Kuomintang, also known as the Nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, seized nominal power. This period is so complicated and difficult, I'm going to have to skip over the details, as they're not essential to know, but the key event was the invasion by Japan in 1937. This turned an already bloody civil war into a three-way street fight that killed something like 20 million people and was marked by some of the bloodiest and most horrific fighting anywhere in the world. We generally ignore what happened in China during World War II, and especially what happened after the Chinese defeat in August 1945, but the war went on from the mid-1920s to 1949, and its aftershocks can still be felt all over China today. At the end of it all, Kuomintang had been driven out of the mainland and took refuge on Taiwan, where they proclaimed themselves to be the legitimate government of the Republic of China, or ROC. Meanwhile, back in what was now called Beijing, Mao declared the CCP as the legitimate government of the People's Republic of China, or the PRC. Both parties claimed that there was only one China. Both parties claimed to have ultimate rule. Although Taiwan is not a dictatorship anymore and it's lost its seat in the UN in the 1970s, things remain broadly the same. We're going to have to leave things there for today with President Xi's hero Mao Zedong about to take the reins of power and do a Stalin. When we come back, we'll cover the greatest hits, famine, the Great Leap Forward, more famine, the Cultural Revolution and probably a little bit more famine.